All right, our next interview is with Lloyd Curry. Uh, Lloyd is well known as a bibliographer, a bookseller, uh, author, etc. He's brought some of his stuff with him, and we'll get to that in a minute. But first, Lloyd, just give us some uh, your background, family, schools, where you grew up, siblings, etc. <clears throat> well, uh, I was born in San Francisco, uh, lived uh, for a few years, actually up until the first year of high school in the Central Valley of California, mainly in Stockton. Uh, my uh, father uh, worked for the Bank of America, and <clears throat> he was... Uh, uh, I guess basically his title was chief cashier, and uh, so he didn't leave the bank until the books were balanced. Uh, he was a frustrated astronomer, a mathematician. He could add up a string of a zillion numbers in his head. He got transferred to San Francisco. We moved to Palo Alto. Uh, I <clears throat> went to Coverly, which now... It no longer exists. <clears throat> that was uh, we were our rival was uh, Palo Alto High. Oh wow! <laughs> so uh, basically, of course, that at that particular point in time, that was kind of like a scholarly community. Uh, we were also at war with the Russians, so it was work, work, work when we were in high school. Uh, so we put our nose to the grindstone. My interest at that particular point in time was biological science. That was what I wanted to do. However, I hated math. <laughs> so that kind of blew that out of the water. Uh, when I got to college, I regretted some of the decisions that I'd made early on. I like liter love literature, etc. So I decided I was going to be an English teacher. I knew I didn't have the sort of smarts to teach in college, uh, but I figured I'd make a good secondary school educator. And uh, so I thought, well, you know, teaching. I'll do, I'll do history minor, English major. So about that time, I discovered uh, library science because I was, uh, at that point, I should back up and say that when I moved to Palo Alto, shall I do the book bookstore thing now, I always haunted secondhand bookstores. There was a wonderful secondhand bookstore downtown, but it was run by an irascible old man who, <laughs> if you wanted to buy a book, he'd take it out of your hands and say, I priced that 20 years ago. Now, this was even to, uh, to kids. Uh, he hated being interrupted. He generally spent his time in a, in, a, in a sofa chair or a stuffed chair listening to classical music with his back turned to the door. <laughs> Great salesmanship, huh? <laughs> you know, probably know the sure. dealer, Bell's, what is it, Bell's, Bell's Books. Yeah, yeah, Bell's Books. Uh, there was another guy down on California Avenue who ran a junk store, basically. His name was Rog Rogaway, if I remember correctly. I have no clue as to what happened to him. He just disappeared sort of disappeared. Yeah. Uh, but I went to work for him for 50 cents an hour. <laughs> I worked after afternoons. I worked Saturdays. Uh, nowadays, I guess that's, what, the home of not Google, but Facebook or so one of them is right, right there on California yeah. Street, right. Silicon Valley now. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he fired me after, for no reason other than he couldn't afford to pay me. Mm. Uh, and I was, uh, I was at, uh, I didn't know what to do with myself. Uh, <laughs> So I walked into William P. Reedon's bookstore one day, and I'm out in the front, because I was kind of like, I don't know, not put off is not the word, uh, fearful, fearful of walking into the lion's den, so yeah. to speak, because you could hear Bill uh, two blocks away. Yeah, he had a bellow for his voice. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I'm out there hovering in the poetry. There was a little poetry room just as you walked in the door, and then stairways going off to the right-hand side, and he comes out and he says, Sonny, how would you like a job? <laughs> <laughs> so, so my first job was going out and cleaning up the pond fronts, which had fallen down on the ground and mowing <laughs> the lawn. And, of course, then the next thing you do is pack it. Okay, well, his kind of packing was actually, it, it was interesting. Uh, he used to uh, sell, a, well, sold a large volume of bound, bound volumes of newspaper 
years. So these things were like immense. Mm. And we had to learn how to, you know, they would come up to here when you were packing them. So I was taught how to do the corrugated paper and then, and then put the, uh, the seal on the end so that if you threw it up against the wall, it wouldn't bash the corners. Uh, so anyway, I sort of worked from the ground up. And, uh, of course, we did things like inventorying, using the old jeweler's inventory system with a great big ledger where you recorded everything in the book. Those were dreaded days. That happened Saturday mornings. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, through reading, I, I, I had a really good opportunity of meeting famous collectors, famous librarians, famous dealers from Japan and England, Mags mm -hmm. Brothers, everybody. Yeah. Reedon was a magnet because he used to get really interesting collections, many times on consignment. Uh, he, was a good, he was a good scout and a good dealer and knew the ground, you know, the ground rules. By, if you're a generalist, if you haven't seen it before, you know, buy it if you can. <coughs> that was the rule of thumb. Uh, <coughs> so when I was working for him in California, I also, I became a collector. And the first, and first thing I collected was California fiction, uh, Yosemite material. I collected Yosemite material because I went to Yosemite once with my parents. We stayed in Wawona. And in Wawona, at the time that we were staying there, they were developing, or they were building a historical center. And the historical center had mining material. They had the old stamp mills and stuff from an, uh, the Great Sierra Mine, which was uh, probably the highest mine yeah. in California. And I looked at that and I thought, you know, this is really fascinating. This is really fascinating. What I really want to know is I want to know the history of this area what it's all about, what happened here. Obviously, there were interesting things going on other than people just coming in to look at the scenery. So I became interested in uh, the people, you know, who was there and doing what and so on and so forth. And so I started a book collection. And, of course, <clears throat> I, got, I went from the basic books, uh, the books I could buy in the museum library, Mm -hmm. uh, to s ferreting out the books that were mentioned in the bibliographies in the, in the back. And, of course, at that time, I, mean, I didn't know anything about Francis Farquhar's bibliography, <laughs> although I found out about it soon. My uh, outside of bookseller men mentors, like, like John Swingle, Alta California Books, major supplier of material to me, reading, of course, I can still remember the first John Muir book I bought was an inscribed copy of the Mountains of California. It cost me twelve dollars and fifty cents. <laughs> A bargain by today's standards. <laughs> you know, standards. less discount. Um, so, uh, but a mentor, probably the earliest non-book dealer mentor I had was uh, Herbert Evans. Yeah. Yeah, the invent uh, who uh, discovered vitamin E, and he and I, I met him at Bill's shop. And he would come to me after a while, and he'd say, what's new? You know, mm -hmm. So I'd show him whatever we'd, we'd got. We developed a, a, a friendship. He used to actually come over to my house and, and look at the Yosemite collection, and then we'd talk about Yosemite because he was interested in it too. And uh, one day he, he, he said, I told him the book I really wanted. I said, I want an Ansel Adams Sierra Nevada, Sierra Nevada Trail which, of course, even then was almost unfindable yeah. book and expensive. And one day he shows up, he showed up with a mint copy, wow. and he said, you know what? He said, I know you really want this book. He says, find something in your collection to trade for it. Mm. <laughs> so, so I got my, my Sierra Nevada Trail. Um, and uh, it was just it was a wonderful time to grow up, and uh, I was treated like, uh, like an adult. You know, and, and at that particular point in time, I basically were coming a long uh, way around to the main point. Uh, I decided that college didn't really mean all that much to me, that I, had, I, I didn't want to be a school teacher, I didn't want to be a librarian. I wanted to, be, I wanted to deal with the books. 
because I was getting such an education there. Reedon had such a tremendous reference library. That was the one thing he and his sometime partner, Carl Zamboni, always stressed. They stressed two things. They said, you have the reference books and you know how to use them. You know where to look. You're going to find the information on practically any book that's ever been published. The second thing they said was, after you find that information, then you tell the story of the book, because that's how you're going to sell the book. You're going to tell the book's story. So now this is very early on, as far as I'm concerned. Now, now we have got to a point where we tell the story of a book in many pages on the internet. We write a whole history of the book, explaining to everybody what this, what this is all about. Uh, but in the old days, uh, and in the case of some of the things that I do, popular fiction, uh, we have to tell the story because nobody knows, nobody knows yeah. uh, what the book is about without explaining it. That puts a hook on it, which allows us to, to find, as booksellers, the customer who might be interested in that book. Uh, it could be anything, a story about imaginary early radio. Okay, well, then that allows you to sell it maybe to somebody who's interested in early radio. Um, and that's the way, actually, that is the way we work in our popular fiction, for the most part, is uh, <clears throat> if it's a Western, where is it set, uh, et cetera. <clears throat> Talk a little about your chronology. Uh, what, what, what happened after you worked for Readings? Go take us from Readings okay. to yeah, present that's a, day. That's, 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 a, um, uh, that's a good question. Very valid. Uh, when I reached my decision that I did not want to be in, 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 uh, uh, engaged uh, professionally in scholarly pursuits, uh, I went to Bill Reedon and I said, what's my, what's my future here? Uh, and he said, well, he said, you don't have any. <laughs> That's pretty blunt. <laughs> very, he was very, very blunt. But, but he, was, he was very kind. But what else could he say? He said, you have been an exemplary part-time employee, and that is really what I want. And I, I would also like to have my son, Bo, enter the business. So they're really, for an adult, you know, wanting to pursue a career as a bookseller, I do not have a, a position for you. So I picked up the phone and I called Mike Ginsburg, <laughs> <laughs> who had said to me in uh, the bar, I believe, at the Ambassador Hotel at a book fair, uh, if you'd ever, you know, you ever want to take a full-time job in the antiquarian book business, call me and come to Boston. So in, what is that, February of 1965, <coughs> I came to Boston and went to work for J.S. Canner and Company uh, to develop their American Literature Department. Uh, the American Literature Department was a, uh, what, a, uh, a favorite of uh, Eugene Schwab, who was one of the partners at Canner's. Uh, his interest was early American fiction in magazines as well as books. Uh, and uh, we just sort of went on for there. I remember that the first project that I had, I had a rudimentary knowledge of American fiction. Basically, I knew the classics. I'd read some things. Uh, but perhaps, fortunately, I had a grasp of what might be rare, you know, what might, might be good. And I sort of got my feet wet immediately because I, I was handed, I was handed a, a, a box with, with index cards and uh, told to price the cards because they wanted to get out a catalog within what was it, a few weeks or a, few, or a month or whatever. So <laughs> I'm not even sure at that particular point in time whether I knew what right fiction was, <laughs> the bibliography, right fiction being the bibliography of American fiction from its beginning up to 1900. Uh, so this was totally, totally new <laughs> to me. So I had to get some sort of an anchor somewhere dealing with, you know, saying, okay, well, James Fenimore Cooper is worth this, and 
Washington Irving is worth that, and Ambrose Bierce fits in here somewhere. What's this other, you know, what's this other stuff worth? And of course, at that time, what were we doing? We were buying books for 50 cents or a dollar, just sort of general fiction, and uh, marking them up to uh, 10 or 12, 50 or 15 dollars for an average book, and selling them to institutional libraries. Uh, and I can recall that Canner worked in some, in some respects the same as Readin and probably other book dealers that I am unaware of, where we used modern technology at that particular point in time, which involved uh, a 914 photocopy uh, machine from Xerox, yeah. uh, where we would uh, take index cards, or in the case of Readin, it was title pages. Uh, and you photocopied the index cards or the title pages, you priced it up, and you sent it off to a library. The library picked what they wanted, and then you sent it to the next library. So uh, that was basically the operation. Uh, I remember at Canner uh, going in and asking for my final raise, which was <laughs> $175. <laughs> And uh, they said, okay, buddy, that's it. That's, that's as far up as you're going to go uh, for the uh, certainly foreseeable future and possibly forever. And uh, then I believe it was our office manager or something came in at one point, and we were having some sort of a bibliographical discussion and said, you know, you guys shouldn't uh, be talking as much. You should be working. And at that particular time, I said, I think I'm leaving. Mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so we started Literary Heritage, and Mike Ginsburg uh, left shortly thereafter and started Western Hemisphere. These were sponsored by uh, Eugene Schwab. Uh, that lasted, for me, that lasted a very short period of time. I don't know why. Uh, perhaps because I felt it was kind of a blind end, and uh, I didn't see myself as being a clerk or a. Yeah, you know, I just wanted to work for myself. And so I started my own business. Uh, that would have been, when, 67 maybe? Because I think yeah. I, moved, I moved to upstate New York in August of 69 probably. So mm, with our first operation was out of an apartment in Mattapan. Yeah. And uh, that was very enjoyable. It was interesting. Uh, at that particular point in time, my mentors around here would have been probably uh, Paul Richards yeah. more than anybody else. Paul was very kind to me. Uh, he and his mother were very sweet people. Uh, and Paul basically said to me, whatever, whatever I have in books, if I get any books, take them on consignment, sell them, pay me. He's a good guy. So, uh, <clears throat> so that worked out very nicely. As a matter of fact, I believe my first catalog, about half of it I bought, and half of it came, <laughs> came from Paul oh. Richards, who had just bought. I did buy from him a very fine collection. Just, just as I went into business, he got in a Prokosh material yeah. and had some of the Butterfly books, et cetera, and I actually had the sense to buy them. Uh, and uh, did, did very well. That uh, helped me out through the next few catalogs. And at that time, I wanted to be a generalist. So we were doing Americana uh, as well as uh, literary first editions and 19th century American fiction. Uh, I had a partner at that time, uh, Ronald Kizar, who's actually still in existence yeah. and has worked off and on for Ken Sanders as I, uh, right. yeah, uh, and, Ro and Ron Ronald was a radical. <laughs> He's in the right place. Yeah, ex well, well, no, he was Earth First. Oh, really? Yes, he was with the Earth Firsters. He moved to Arizona and I lost touch with him. I thought yeah. he died, yeah. li literally. And when I, I read in a Ken Sanders catalog that he was selling an, an, an Edward Abbey book and it was inscribed, he, Ken went on about the great inscription to Ronald Kizar and so on and so forth, and I called up and I said, is that D. Ronald <laughs> Kizar? He said, he said he certainly is. You know, every once in a while he comes and catalogs books for him. Mm -hmm. So I always thought that that was kind of funny. But uh, so, and more questions. Well, we've got about five or six minutes. Oh, uh, okay. Why don't you... Uh, <laughs> 
as a bibliographer and, and as an author, one you're a specialist. One of your specialties is science fiction. So why don't you talk a little bit about your science fiction bibliography, and then your other one is uh, is Yosemite and the Big Trees, which you've also written a bibliography about. We've got about five minutes, and why okay. don't you give us a, a minute or two on each of these? And uh, can we get this on camera, Jane? Yeah. Okay. Just hold it. All right. Talk this about this it. this uh, this book <coughs> was written uh, primarily uh, to be a uh, the Merle Johnson of of science fiction and fantasy literature. It covers about two I think two hundred and fifteen authors. What we were trying to do there was get that information down on paper before it was lost. Uh, this is a problem with popular fiction is bibliographical control. Uh, it's a it's a, it's a very complex area. It's a lot of fun uh, to work this information out. Uh, of course, I mean, science fiction and fantasy covers a lot of territory, so uh, it's not all just pop lit, you know, or sci-fi as it's termed. Yeah. Uh, so that was the primary reason for doing this. Bec as you know, there's so much bibliographical, I don't know, hoopla over things like, uh, <clears throat> say, Dracula. You know, is it really a first printing? You know, or you know, there are lots of different different issues and states and so on. But actually, there aren't really. There's 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 one printing with two variations. If the page of ads isn't in the back, which is integral to the last signature, then it's a later printing. Mm -hmm. But we have a lot of dealers who will not admit that. Well, they, don't, they don't accept <laughs> yeah. it, huh? Anyway, they don't accept it, so that's why you need to have bibliographies. Okay. Uh, the other bibliography is basically a labor of love. This is the bibliography of Yosemite, <coughs> the High Sierra, and the Big Trees. This covers a period from the earliest uh, book, which is uh, Zenas Leonard, now probably proven wrong. He was not the first person to to see Yosemite Valley. He probably saw something a little further north. Uh, that was, uh, what, 1839? 1833. And it goes up to 1900. Uh, in the works uh, is a, well, there is a CD of the, Sierra, of the, uh, of the uh, science fiction bibliography, which was done in 2005, which updates information in the book. It doesn't, it doesn't go further chronologically, but there are several thousand corrections. Thousand uh, corrections? Oh, yeah, well, additions, right. mostly, mostly additions of states and printings oh, and see. so on, things that we, we didn't know before. There were actually maybe 30 books that got added because they were unknown to us at the time. Most of them were pseudonymous, and we uh -huh. discovered later on that they were written by people in the book. In the book, Yeah, see, this covers popular literature. So it's not just science fiction and fantasy. It's science fiction and fantasy authors, but it covers their entire out output of fiction, and in some cases, their nonfiction as well. This may be updated someday, I don't know. This will be updated. <coughs> this, the uh, uh, Sierra Nevada bibliography, goes up to 1900. Uh, I do have detailed information up to the, through the mid-1970s. I think what we're going to do is we'll either cut it off at 1940, or a more logical cutoff point is going to be 1965, just before the Mission 66 project to upgrade all of the parks, mm -hmm. at which time we entered a whole new era of environmental impact statements and other similar things. Now, I probably have the world's second or third largest collection of environmental <laughs> impact <laughs> statements. <laughs> but they, and, and they are fascinating. They actually do deserve their own bibliography because they're actually they're, the archaeology and the history that's covered in these environmental impact statements is of considerable importance. And you know, like historic buildings, they they did I yeah. think for Yosemite they did something like a three volume uh, uh, survey of historic buildings, mm. those that were currently in existence, those that were 
partially in existence and those that had vanished. Uh, so uh, it's, been an, it's uh, been an interesting career. You know? yeah, it's, it's been a great career. I wish we had more time to chat yeah. and, and maybe what we'll, what we'll try to do at some point is get another interview with you and we can talk a little bit further about a lot of other things. Okay. But our time is up. And thank you very much for participating. Enjoyed it. <laughs>